a little. All right. What do you think if we get us going, Rebecca? Yeah, looks good. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, yep. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to um, our Seattle Port Commissioner Environmental Justice Candidate Forum. My name is Paulina Lopez, and I am the Executive Director for the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition. Um, it's a pleasure for me to uh, have all candidates here with us today sharing and as well as all our attendees. Um, so I want to welcome you all on behalf of the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition and also on behalf of the Seattle Parks Foundation. Um, first, um, I would like to announce if you need an interpreter to please uh, dial the number that is below. Si necesita un intérprete, por favor. Eh, marque el 206-2038 que podremos conectarle con una persona que puede hablar su idioma. Muchísimas gracias por estar acá. As I said, uh, I represent an organization that is on the Duwamish Valley. Um, it's the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition, uh, which the mission is the, to elevate the voice of those impacted by the Duwamish River and other environmental injustices for a clean, healthy, equitable environment for people and wildlife. Beyond monitoring our cleanup of the Seattle Duwamish River, uh, we are guided by community voice, which is negatively impacted by environmental, social, and economic impacts for pollution and climate change. When we wanted to be together, um, this is an important election for us and we um, wish our candidates the best and they will be introduced very briefly by um, my co-host, Rebecca. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight and joining us for this conversation. I'm the CEO of the Seattle Parks hey, Foundation. Uh, uh, the Parks Foundation brings together community and civic leaders, donors and public partners, as well as our local communities around the city to create a thriving and accessible and connected system of public space for the health and wellness and happiness of all people. We are very excited tonight to, um, to co-host this with our friends at DRCC. And um, I wanted, before we get started, I wanted to share a few important facts about the port um, as well. Um, I will do that after we do our land acknowledgement. Paulina. Yes, so before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge that we are, and specifically me, I am on the Duwamish, uh, Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish, past and present, and the, the original stewards of the lands and the waters um, for this time and memorial. This acknowledgement only becomes meaningful when combined with accountable relationships and informed actions and acts only as a first step in honoring the land we are and their people. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks. Um, so before I get into how to ask a question, I well, I'll, I'll do that first and then I'll, I'll introduce the port a little bit. Um, everyone who is in the um, webinar, um, you don't have the ability to chat, but you can ask a question. So how you ask the question, you just go into the Q&A button, you type in your question and you push submit. Um, those of you that see the questions, um, you, can, you can thumbs up those questions if you want to any questions that get um, more, um, uh, votes, the, we will have space at the end of this um, 
forum to be able to uh, weave in those questions from the community. They're on the on the line right now. So uh, th please uh, encourage you to add your questions throughout the forum as it's going along so we can engage and, and bring those uh, to the forefront for our candidates. So um, the Port of Seattle has um, a really important responsibility for our region. Uh, they, especially when it comes to sustainability, environmental justice, and um, the impacts uh, on our community and climate. They ha have the ability to influence noise pollution, industrial waste, climate and air quality, uh, energy usage and impact, habitat and green space, waste reduction and recycling, water quality, and uh, our wildlife corridors. Um, our airport serves about 51 million passengers with 22 billion in revenue and 151,000 uh, jobs. Our seaport is a $66 billion business with 58,000 jobs, 3 million containers, and uh, 1,684 vessels in 2020 that came through um, the port. So as you can tell, this is a really important job, which is why we really wanted to make sure we took some time, especially when we think about green space, environmental justice, climate impact. This is a really valuable co conversation with our candidates. And so um, we're, I'm gonna introduce the candidates and then each candidate's get an opportunity to have an opening statement for about 90 seconds. And um, that opening statement, what we would like you to address is um, as you're thinking about it, um, how do you define environmental and climate justice, particularly with regards to near port communities? What should the port be doing to make a difference in those communities? And what is your vision and policies that you will achieve that, to, that you will use to achieve that vision? So I'm gonna move through each of the candidates um, and introduce them as we move through this uh, uh, opening statement. So for position one, we have Ryan Calkins and Norman Sigler. I don't believe Norman is here, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. For position three, we have Hamdi Mohammed and Stephanie Bauman, welcome. And for position four, we have Peter Steinbrook and Toshiko Hasegawa. Thank you both, thank you all for coming today. So I'm gonna begin with position one. Um, Ryan Calkins, if you wanna share your opening statement. Thank you all for having us here tonight. Um, as uh, port commission candidates, we, we don't get quite the spotlight that some of the other positions do. And so having a dedicated forum for us, I think is a, a wonderful opportunity to dig deeper into the, the impact of the Port of Seattle on our communities and also to learn where each of us as candidates uh, stand on issues. And I, I think it's especially important for us to be public about where we plan to govern so that you can hold our feet to the fire when, when and if we are elected. In my case, this is, uh, I'm, I'm closing in on the end of my uh, first term as a commissioner. Prior to this, I uh, owned and ran a, a small family business in the Georgetown neighborhood, uh, an important distribution company. Um, that had uh, was sort of the successor to a, a business that my grandfather had started in uh, 1970 in Inner Bay. And so my family was reliant upon uh, the, the maritime aspects of the, the Port of Seattle, and I was quite familiar with that side of things. At the same time, I grew up as an environmentalist and uh, believed in uh, the importance of sustainability as an operating concept, whether it's a business or a government agency or how we run our households. Um, and so when I joined the family business, that became a passion of mine. And, and we became an industry leading business in sustainability initiatives, uh, looking at life cycle analyses of the products that we imported and distributed, and uh, created a standard that became the standard for the entire uh, important distribution of ceramic tile and stone in the United States. I became the president of the, the Ceramic Tile Distributors Association of America as a result of that work. And I hope I brought some sustainability chops to the Port of Seattle when I came. Uh, I, I sincerely look forward to this conversation and, and I hope I'm reelected so I can keep working with these communities. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, we will move to the next position. Um, and uh, I believe we'll, that would be position three with uh, Hamdi. 
Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Hamdi Mohammed. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share my candidacy for the Port of Seattle Commission position three. I'll just start by sharing a little, sharing a little bit about myself. I came to the US when I was three years old after a civil war broke out in Somalia. And one of my first ports of entries was actually at SeaTac Airport. Um, my father was a trucker and my mother was a SeaTac Airport worker. So I know firsthand how important it is that working families are protected. Today, I work for King County um, Executive Dow Constantine. I advise on the county's $12 billion budget and manage initiatives that invest millions into our small businesses, community organizations, and COVID-19 response. Um, I believe I have both the lived experience and the professional experience to be um, a champion um, for our communities on, on the Port Commission. The Port of Seattle's largest revenue stream is actually SeaTac Airport, yet there's never been a Port Commissioner from South King County. And as a resident of SeaTac, I am prepared to be a strong voice for cleaner aviation fuels, stronger sound installation programs, and tackling um, ultra fine particle pollutions with leaders across uh, King County and our state. Um, I think the, the wildfires that ravaged the West Coast in the past few summers show us that climate change, air quality issues, economic injustices, and um, COVID-19 are all interlinked. And com combating all of that takes honesty, accountability, and innovation. And I'm prepared to take all of that on and be a champion for our environment and for our communities. Thank you again for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Stephanie Bauman, also for position three. Hi, thanks everybody for having me. Stephanie Bauman, uh, currently serving port commissioner. Um, I am really glad to be here tonight. I appreciate the fact that you are sponsoring this. Um, I am actually up here on Beacon Hill, um, right above the Duwamish. Um, I've been up here for 14 years. Uh, it's a community that I care very much about because I have the opportunity sitting here on Beacon Hill to look at port operations. Um, I'm looking down at our harbor. Um, I look down at what we do and understand the impacts of port operations on our daily lives, um, whether it is from our maritime operations, from our marine terminals at Harbor Island, or from the planes that go overhead, which you might hear when I'm speaking later on tonight. Um, I love what we do at the Port of Seattle, but I realize that um, we have challenges all the time that we are trying to face. Um, it is the quintessential challenge. How do we combat climate change, which is upon us now and still manage to operate infrastructure of statewide significance on behalf of the residents of all of Washington state. We need to make sure that as we're operating SeaTac Airport and our marine terminals and our other investments, that making sure our residents that live most directly around them and are impacted by them have the quality of life that they deserve. Um, I know we've got some questions later about what environmental justice means um, and social justice, and that's what it means to me, is making sure that we have that quality of life for those most impacted, that they are not uh, realizing greater impacts than others that are benefiting from the port. Um, I, during the day, I'll just a little bit about me as well. I am the executive director of a statewide nonprofit, a social impact agency that works with low income residents and communities to help build them up through um, financial assets, whether it's home ownership, small business development, education, or investing in savings. Um, this is work I've done for 10 years. I'm very proud of what we do, and I've taken that experience and brought it to the port, reinvesting um, in a variety of programs and bringing some new initiatives forward. Um, I know we don't have much more time, so I'll let other candidates speak. And um, again, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, the next is position four, and we'll start with uh, Peter Steinbrook. Well, great. Um, I Thanks very much for hosting this forum, Seattle Parks and Duwamish River Coalition. I have been friends of both for over two decades, in fact, and actively involved in early efforts with the Duwamish River Coalition in particular to insist on the highest uh, level of cleanup possible through the Superfund process and e EPA uh, process as well, going back over 20 years. I am deeply committed to ensuring that we do uh, uh, the very best we can uh, for everyone and for the environment, for 
the health of the people, our children, uh, habitat, uh, and the fish, of course. And um, I have devoted a good part of my life to what I call environmental sustainability, urban environmental sustainability. I studied at Harvard for a year of self-study around practices of greening urban infrastructure. I consider myself an expert in the field, and I've taken that expertise to the Port of Seattle in many ways, uh, borrowing also from my experience of 10 years on the Seattle City Council, where I led numerous efforts to develop innovative policies and practices such as zero waste, complete streets, carbon emission as a pollutant in the environmental review process, tree planting, and pedestrian and bicycle master planning, just to name a few. I've continued that work at the Port of Seattle, and I know very clearly that environmental sustainability is not possible without environmental justice. Uh, we can't just talk about cleaning up the environment here and there and uh, with, without considering the, the people who are most deeply impacted first as a priority. I believe we have been demonstrating that commitment through programs such as the uh, Duwamish River Valley Community Benefits Program, which is a permanent uh, partnership that we established at the port. As one example, we've also partnered with, um, with, with, with uh, the, um, green, uh, excuse me, the urban forest uh, program with Forterra, uh, working to develop uh, sustainability uh, and uh, tr tree stewardship programs in communities and cities throughout South King County, utilizing the $10 million community impact fund that I led the establishment of with the full support of the commission that continues. And it's so, to, so far has funded over 24 projects and we've planted thousands of trees already at the same time, giving youth uh, opportunities uh, to learn skills and, and get paid for it in green jobs. Um, I'm okay. excited to continue this work. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> All right. Um, and our uh, final candidate for uh, position four is uh, Toshiko Hasegawa. Welcome. Thank you so very much. Good evening, everybody, <gasps> beloved community members. My name is Toshiko Grace Hasegawa, and I am a fourth generation Japanese American from the Beacon Hill neighborhood in South Seattle. Actually, our story begins as a family four generations ago when my great grandparents immigrated through the port of Seattle. Um, by boat in search of economic opportunity for themselves. And they set down roots here in Beacon Hill because it was actually one of the only neighborhoods where they were allowed to buy and own property and to be able to live due to the discriminatory redlining laws that were in place in the city at the time. Um, I continue to live here today with my own daughter, my husband um, on the flight path. And I see every single day the impact that the Port of Seattle has on our communities. Today I work as Executive Director of Washington State's Commission on Asian Pacific American Affairs where really essentially we advise the governor and the legislature and all other state agencies on issues impacting historically marginalized communities. It was established in recognition that if you are not at the table, you are on the menu as a result of the civil rights movement that demanded um, direct access to policy making. Um, and in that capacity, we listen to community members who are impacted and have actually begun to create a language around um, especially immigrant, refugee, and limited English proficient communities about climate change um, and pollution and how it impacts them. And, um, and it's not that we've been missing, it's that so much of our communities have been busy surviving from other crises. So when I think critically about environmental justice and what that means, in my opinion and in my perspective, it means recognizing inherently that systems of oppression are common seeds um, to uh, racial discrimination and to pollution, to public health outcomes, that these things are inextricably linked and you cannot address one without addressing the the other. 
And the way that you address that means quite specifically, environmental justice requires centering the experience of those people impacted. And that means people of color and indigenous people who are the original stewards of this land. Um, I look forward to in sharing more in our conversation um, about our ideas of how the port can be a better partner in uplifting our communities and addressing some of the historical harms that have been inflicted and continue to be inflicted upon predominantly Black, brown, indigenous, and working class people um, living in, uh, in proximity to port operations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just a reminder to our participants, um, if you're just joining us, you can um, submit questions in the Q&A. Uh, and if, you, uh, if there's questions that you see in the Q&A that you'd like to have um, us moderators ask, um, you can vote those up. Um, and I will hand it over to my colleague Paulina for the first round of questions. And before you do that, can I just say, Rebecca, Toshko's name is pronounced Toshko, no I. So I'm speaking on your behalf, but she, did, she gets that every time. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, candidates, for your introductions and statements. And um, most of you, um, of course, recognize the impact that Nearport communities have. So the first question I'm going to ask is going to be for position one, um, Ryan. Um, Nearport communities are affected by freight, traffic, airplane noise, and pollution, which contribute to a life expectancy dispar disparity. In our cases in the Duwamish Valley, for example, this 13 years. Community members have concerns about issues such as the expansion of Terminal 5 to support larger container cargo ships. How would you prioritize the health of Nearport communities alongside with the pressure to be a competitive port? Thanks, Paulina. Um, you know, one thing, just over this last year, we've, we've been engaged in a pretty intense conversation with the port about how we uh, accelerate our um, climate um, activism efforts in order to address uh, the urgency that we've all come to learn through the IPCC report. Uh, you know, we've got basically till 2030. And so uh, just this week, we announced that we were going to accelerate our, our targets to 2040 from 2050 on a number of things and also begin to create some um, phased in benchmarks to allow staff uh, greater powers to address some of these issues related to climate change. Uh, that's wonderful on a global scale, but the question is what are we doing uh, right here for local communities in terms of the local air pollution impacts, the uh, criteria pollutants that um, impact uh, our children with asthma and, uh, as you mentioned, shortened lifespans uh, because of the long-term impacts of them. I think the most important thing we can do is electrify everything. Uh, that's what we need to uh, be focused on right now. That means on our terminals, we need to electrify the cargo handling equipment. In our ports, we need to be electrifying the ocean-going vessels and the harbor-going vessels. And each of these things uh, sort of sits on a scale of difficulty. The good news is the land-based stuff, we know we, the technology is there. It's a little bit expensive, but we need to invest in that. And we've got a plan to do that. Um, we're going to uh, work with state legislatures to ensure that uh, we're given the authority to do some of these things as well. And then as we all wait for news on Build Back Better, which would include significant federal funding to make the transition from, from diesel powered equipment over to electric equipment, we've got our fingers crossed that um, that comes through. And um, we've had recently the opportunity to meet with a number of Biden administration officials to to show them what it looks like. Here are our terminals, here are the communities. This needs to happen quickly. Um, in addition to that, we've got a Seattle Central Waterfront Clean Energy Plan that the port initiated in the city of Seattle through Seattle City Light uh, is now moving forward on. And that's a 30 year plan to not only electrify the, the Port of Seattle uh, properties, but all of the properties, the, the ferry terminal, which is a huge contributor as well, uh, which is a Washington state property, but then all the private properties along there as well. So that um, the impacts from the entire maritime industry, not just that part that goes through the Port of Seattle would be addressed as well. Sorry, I ran out of time. There's so much more to say. Yes, absolutely. I appreciate your respect in the minute. And just as a reminder, that because we have so many candidates, um, it's challenging. Does anybody else, because you don't have uh, your uh, counterpart here, uh, but does um, anybody else would like to answer that question as well from the other positions? Sure, I'll jump in really quickly. Just, um, you know, there's a few things that Ryan did a great job of outlining 
um, a lot, some of most of the efforts that we're doing, but not all of them. And I think it's important to note um, a couple of things about Terminal 5 that maybe the general public doesn't know. Um, Terminal 5 has on dock rail, which is critically important um, for a couple of reasons. It's a way to get um, trucks off the road, quite frankly, so that we have the ability at Terminal 5 to have cargo that's offloaded from the vessels go directly onto rail lines, reducing the number of diesel emitting trucks that come through the port. And so um, Terminal 5 will have a huge advantage in terms of um, obviously efficiency, but most importantly, uh, health impacts for the Duwamish Valley. I'd add on to that, um, shore power is um, being put into Terminal 5. So that's the ability to plug in um, the vessels when they are at berth so that they can shut off their engines. Um, really proud of that investment. It's about $30 million. And then la uh, two more things I'd add as well. Um, I, I am a personal big proponent. I believe my colleagues are probably everybody on this call of moving towards zero emission drayage trucks. Um, for those that are watching that don't know what a drayage truck is, that is a truck that moves the cargo in short distances from a terminal to a warehouse, for example, or from the terminal to the rail yard if you're at Terminal 18. Um, every port has some sort of drayage operations. Not every container can go onto on-dock rail. And so to the extent that um, you have a drayage operation, making sure that those vehicles get to a zero emissions um, is a big goal of mine and something I've worked on for the last couple of years. There's a lot of great technology out there right now um, for electric trucks, but that's not the only technology, um, but it's very, very encouraging. And then the last thing I'd add to this point as well is um, about stormwater. The Port of Seattle um, about seven years ago created its own stormwater utility. Um, most people are unaware of that. We are the only port um, in the state of Washington, we might be the only port in the country that also operates a stormwater utility. The reason that we, the Port Commission at the time, which I was on, um, made the decision to do that is because it gave us the ability to reinvest in the infrastructure without having to jump through the hoops of going through the city of Seattle or the city of SeaTac. Um, it's provided enormous Thank benefit. Okay. I'll yeah, leave it Joe. there. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, it's time. Uh, I'm going to move on to another question. Um, and uh, this question is um, for um, Hamdi. And um, your um, as an industry partner, uh, the port has worked to support the opening of the Maritime High School uh, to provide jobs and career pathways in the maritime industry especially for BIPOC youth uh, that, who have historically been underrepresented in the field. Uh, as uh, Maritime High School moves through its next five years, um, ongoing support and connection to the port is really critical to help them understand and develop their careers. Um, how would you in this position as port commissioner provide support, especially as it pertains to BIPOC youth in the Duwamish Valley? Um, and um, if you consider, um, I, I would transition that also to SeaTac um, and the BIPOC youth that are in SeaTac and how do you connect them to the port? Thank you for the question, Rebecca. Um, I actually serve on um, the Maritime High School Advisory Board and Port Commissioner Ryan actually introduced me to the school and the idea, I think maybe it was about two or three years ago. And the moment he shared uh, the, the idea about the school being placed in the Highline District and what it was going to do, I immediately wanted to get involved and support the efforts. Um, right now, in this moment that we're in, in our history, what we're seeing is everyone sees the news, right? We are seeing a rise in demand for shipping, the cost of shipping going up, bottlenecks are everywhere. And while a lot of the supply chain crisis is really due to um, COVID-19, there, it, there was an existing crisis that was going on before then, and that's the labor shortage, right? There's a huge labor shortage that's happening in the maritime industry, and we have a whole young generation of youth who don't know about the maritime industry. It's a very lucrative industry. It's an industry where you can make good living wage jobs, and so many of our young BIPOC kids don't know about that, and um, Maritime High School intends to be that bridge, that bridge that creates not just inter internship programs for our young kids, but pathways to employment. And um, we have to continue to do that. And it needs to be done in partnership with community organizations and our school districts. I'd like to see the Maritime High School curriculum also extended to our public schools, right? Adding that curriculum in, and embedding it into our public schools. And while um, our in, uh, uh, 
the port is in the business of being a landlord and keeping our maritime and aviation industries um, activated and, and moving, um, we also have to look at the big picture and look at the intersectionalities that exist. We have to be able to protect the environment for our kids as well as their education and exposing them to that is so important. So I will be a strong partner on the Port Commission and a, a strong advocate for Maritime High School and the maritime industry as a whole. Great, thank you so much. Um, Stephanie, um, you're also in position three. I thought I'd give you an opportunity to respond uh, briefly to that same question. Sure, me? yeah, but you know what? I'm gonna actually, I hope it's okay, but I'm gonna turn my time over to okay. Commissioner Calkins because he actually created Maritime High School. So I just, I gotta let him talk about it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> thanks Stephanie. I, yeah. I, um, I like to say I instigated it, but the real uh, creators are the students and faculty that are really launching it right now. They're amazing folks who have taken a, the germ of an idea and turned it into something truly remarkable. And yeah, I am fully committed to putting uh, every effort of the Port of Seattle behind this initiative because I genuinely believe it's, uh, it's an example of an enlightened self-interest. These kids, uh, we need these kids to join our workforce at, at, in the maritime field. I mean, every day we're waking up right now to more stories of canceled ferry routes because we can't get uh, a sufficient workforce. And here we have these um, kids who just simply don't, aren't aware of the careers that are available to them. And I'm certain that if they were, whether it's as a marine biologist or a ferry captain or a commercial diver or a longshore worker, there's such incredible opportunity there. And I genuinely believe that Maritime High School is, is going to help unlock that. And, you know, every, we're seeing uh, such great support from community all around. It, it just absolutely warms my heart to see how this thing has just taken off. Great. Thank you. Paulina? We're definitely very grateful and we are partners for the Maritime High School. And when he refers to the seeds, um, uh, Ryan, I think you are referring to our local youth. We has always have that dream to have the Maritime High School here. So thank you for your support. Um, I'm going to move us on. And again, we have reminder of the time is going so fast and we have Q&A that are piling up. So I'm really grateful for your participation, all the attendees. So this time we're going to be uh, moving into position four. Um, and specifically, I would like to be asking about the Duwamish River. Um, as you all know, it's going through uh, a triple threat and allowing more cancer causing chemicals impacted the people, the habitat, specifically the fishing communities from the immigrant um, and refugee communities. What would you do to protect Seattle only river? Um, and the communities living around it to honor the commitment for the full equitable health protective cleanup that includes um, the Lower Duwamish, but also the East Waterway. Um, as we all know, President Philman submitted a letter to EPA calling for more community involvement and respect of the record of decision, as well as uh, full PCB cleanup and Jorgensen Forge. How do you support these and how would you make sure that cleanup continues? Go ahead, uh, Toshiko, I'm sorry. Thank you, Paulina. So as a Beacon Hill girl, I was actually raised fishing out of the Duwamish River, or sometimes we'd go down and we would buy fish from the natives who were selling them from the docks. Now at Kappa, we watch as community members host fun to catch but toxic to eat campaigns in language to raise awareness about the toxins and the pollution because it has that public health impact on our community members. So I'm keenly aware that where I live, um, as you know, my daughter watches airplanes pass overhead, that we have a higher incidence of infant mortality and a lower life expectancy to the, to the, to the tune of seven years. And as you get down below into the Duwamish valleys and along the river, that life expectancy gap, that turns into 13 years for folks living in South Park um, and, um, and all along the river. So this is literally a matter of life and death. And so to answer the question, what we would do um, is we need to hold our standards and keep to our commitment, the 2014 commitment of a total complete cleanup of 
the Duwamish River. If I'm port commissioner, I want to establish a memorandum of understanding with the tribes, the Muckleshoot and the Duwamish, the original keepers of this land that codifies when and how and how often we are actually engaging in these cleanup projects. They're the original stewards of this land with the wisdom on how to be able to restore it. Um, I want to be able to engage in renaming some of these, these landmarks back to their original identities um, because we have to holistically uplift um, our mother, the giver, um, who provides so much to us bountifully. And then of course, we actually have to abide by, um, by social justice and economic and environmental justice principles, which means centering community, communities who are impacted. That means going to them and asking them what they need and how they can be served and then addressing that. So yes, we need a more sustainable future to make sure that we are lessening our carbon footprint, but we also have historical harms that we have to address and we must proactively undo them. Thank you so much. Peter? You're on mute, Peter. Well, I was advocating for uh, the cleanup before the record of decision in 2014 when I served on the Seattle City Council and uh, worked in partnership and directly with the Guamish River Cleanup Coalition to ensure that the highest, um, the strongest commitment to full uh, healthy cleanup of the river was undertaken through that uh, record of decision process. And flash forward here, um, while we are aware that EPA uh, revised its environmental standards nationally, we have taken a position uh, jointly with the partnership with Seattle and the county to go farther and to ask for more community involvement, which we have and which they have agreed to, a meaningful community participation with the most affected. And that will be occurring and I believe has been initiated and there will be a delay in the issuance of the draft uh, recommended cleanup plan for Lower Duwamish and East Waterway uh, pending the um, community engagement, a robust and meaningful community engagement. And I think we will um, reach a point of, of commitment jointly with the participation of affected communities and with the best science and resources we can po possibly bring to bear for the cleanup of Seattle's only river where my dad fished as a boy when his family lived in Georgetown and they caught fish for uh, sustainability for their own sustenance. And my dad and his family had many friends between South Park and Georgetown uh, with very working class people back in those days. Uh, and so I have a long family history there as well. And that is part of my deep commitment to supporting community, centering community in the process of the, uh, the cleanup of the river. And we'll continue to work hard on those, those uh, objectives. Thank you, Peter. Thank you also for your advocacy. Um, okay, so I think we're gonna jump into um, one of the audience questions, Rebecca. Yeah, yeah so um, this, uh, we'll start with, um, Ryan, uh, with this question, um, the port is an incredibly large agency with multiple layers of staff between the commissioners and those who are actually working directly with the community members or carrying out projects. How do you ensure that, um, sorry, that the, the question just disappeared. <laughs> there it is. How do you, how do you ensure that your values as a commissioner are followed through in the day-to-day -day operations um, at the community engagement level? Uh, thanks for the question, Dre. Um, so in my office at the Port of Seattle, I have a big whiteboard that lists all my priorities. And, and down at the bottom in bold letters is my sort of ongoing motto, which is remember who is not at the table, uh, because it's really easy as an elected official um, to get distracted by the, the urgent whoever's email shows up most recently in your inbox or phone call that comes in or headline that you feel like you've got to respond to. Uh, and it's really easy to forget who's not at the table, who doesn't have the time to reach out to their elected official or um, create a community group to raise awareness about an issue. And so 
I think one of the most important things that we can do as a public agency is go out into the community um, to make our information available in the languages spoken in the community, to hire people from the community to, to operate in those places. When I was uh, uh, first out of college, I spent, uh, I, I lived in Latin America for four years and I worked with um, what were called health promoters uh, in rural communities in Central America and, and then in uh, Colombia. And the promoters were the people who came from the community, were trained in the, the areas that needed to be addressed, but then were able to communicate in a way that was um, both uh, understandable to the community and, and that recognized the idiosyncrasies of the community. And I think the port needs to adopt that same kind of model. And so over the last few years, we have been working through um, uh, the development of the, the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion uh, to ensure that we bake that into our processes, that community input is a part of our processes. And so uh, what we're hoping to roll out soon is something called a Community Advisory Board, which will be a, essentially a standing committee of external advisors that serve to uh, provide the commission and ex executive leadership with insights from the community about everything, um, airport operations, maritime operations, uh, other impacts, ways that we can invest. Uh, I imagine I'm out of time now. <laughs> but yes, I was actually going to call Stephanie to also help with that question. So she was kind enough to give you space for the maritime. <laughs> yeah, sure. I should have kicked it to you. The baby. <laughs> sure, no problem. I'll jump in. I'll try and be brief. Um, you know, I think anybody that has watched me on uh, my time on the Port Commission knows um, I am not afraid to ask the tough questions. Um, I dig deep into the details of projects. Um, I frequently bring up things and challenge the staff to uh, question assumptions. Um, I am proud of that. You know, it, it, the question is a great one. It is a big agency. And the folks that work at the port um, are wonderful professionals. They are highly detailed in what they do. Um, it's a really complex organization, whether you're, um, they're on the airport side or the seaport side or economic development. And so I really have a great deal of respect for our staff and what they do. But at the same time, you know, you can get into that, um, that castle up on the hill and not hear the voices from the people. And um, I'll tell a quick story. When I first joined the Port Commission, I think I'd been on about six or nine months. I was in a meeting uh, about the airport and about noise mitigation efforts. And I brought up Beacon Hill. And I said, you know, um, folks on Beacon Hill are right on the flight path. And somebody really high up in our organization at that time um, in the environmental team said, well, you know, if folks decided to move to Beacon Hill, it's, you know, essentially their responsibility for moving to a community that's on the flight path. And I, I was so shocked. I, I couldn't believe it. And clearly this person didn't know that I lived on Beacon Hill. Um, and I just thought, you know, we need a culture change here. We need to really start listening to community members and hearing what they're saying and hearing what their lived experiences are um, around our facilities, the facilities that we manage on behalf of the public. And so um, I, there's always more to do. We can always get better. But I am pretty proud, actually, of the work that this commission has done to reach out to community and solicit their input and be more partners. Um, it's not just, hey, what do you think about this? Is how can we work together? Um, I think I'm probably out of time, but I, um, I'll just end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to move on for the next position, and I'm going to also grab it from uh, Q&A from David, David Mendoza. Would you support replicating aspects of the HEAL Act at the Port of Seattle, such as mandatory environmental justice analysis for rulemaking, capital projects, and policy development, also redirecting 40% of capital investments in overburdened communities? And this is going to be for position. Help me out, Rebecca. Position four, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Toshiko, you wanna start first? Sure. Um, I am so proud of the work that the state has done um, in collaboration with 
impacted communities, um, particularly in the last legislative session, which Governor Inslee has referred to as one of the most consequential legislative sessions um, in state history. And, you know, the HEAL Act had a huge uh, role to play in making sure that what we were um, aiming to do in reducing our carbon footprint and changing our trajectory for our climate crisis um, was an equitable approach. And so the, the HEAL Act specifically, I think, is a wonderful blueprint that can and should be replicated um, on other levels, including at the Port of Seattle. Um, I absolutely love the concept of centering communities, making sure that we are meaningfully allocating funds specifically to those impacted communities. Um, you know, the South King County Fund, $10 million over the course of 10 years is truly just a drop in the bucket. It's not nearly enough to address the deep, deep need um, that is impacting the communities that have generations of pollution and runoff causing higher incidence of, cat, of cancer, asthma, um, uh, higher death rates in our communities. Um, and so we also need to make sure that we are proactively allocating funds into greening um, some of these areas that will truly benefit um, and that means not making decisions like building, clearing out green spaces for parking lots, but actually going to the state legislature and adding it to the Port of Seattle's legislative agenda to look for money like the Evergreen Communities Act um, to make sure that we're continually, not only just not destroying these green spaces, but actually allocating uh, staff and resources to breathe new life into it. Um, and so that can, those benefits can be also be felt for our waterways. Um, there's no shortage of opportunities and willingness and political will. And I think above all, a sense of urgency among some of our leaders at the state with a democratic majority to be able to finally act and do something meaningful for meaningful outcomes and experiences in our community members. Thank you. Peter? Well, great, great question. And I think that the HEAL Act is something that is applied, applies uniformly throughout the state. I don't think there's exemptions uh, that the port is exemption exempted from the analysis of environmental justice issues when it comes to projects that will have an impact. So I fully embrace that. It's been long in coming. Um, I had years ago advocated for uh, the inclusion of carbon emissions as a pollutant as determined by the Supreme Court to be a air pollutant, to be part of the environmental state environmental review process. So some analogies there, but in this case, it, environmental justice has been has been neglected, uh, I think, uh, and and that has to change. So that was the inception of the ten million dollar community impact fund, which my opponent seems to like to routinely trivialize. That is helping hundreds, if not thousands, of people in uh, impacted communities well before the HEAL Act was ever even an idea in the state legislature that the commission approved that funding. And it's showing tremendous results with disproportionately impacted communities, both in ec economic justice and environmental justice. And I don't think it's a trivial matter and I don't think it's a drop in the bucket has been repeatedly said by my opponent. It is very meaningful. It is the most impactful fund that the, the, the Port of Seattle has ever established that goes directly to communities uh, through a, a process that involves partnerships with Forterra, with, with partner in employment and other groups that are leveraging these funds to do even more. And it's my goal to, uh, to add an additional endowment, maybe thanks to a little prodding from my opponent that it needs to be more. Uh, that we extend that, extend it out, and we uh, endow it with an additional 10 million in the years to come. And we continue to, to, to make that kind of investment in community. It takes time to invest meaningfully and to, to have the results that these partnerships are demonstrating. I'm very Thank proud you. of that. So we'll continue that work. Thank you, Peter. And yes, the HELAC, just to confirm, that does not apply to, this, to the port yet, is a state. Low, but we're going to keep pushing. And that was the question. What if we act upon, you know, environmental justice and the recognition for it and all the operations? 
Let's move on with the next question, Rebecca. Yeah, sure. So uh, Hamdi, I wanted to uh, make sure we had a time for you. And then after this question, we will um, move into closing statements uh, from each of the candidates. So um, according to the city data, we have reached a tipping point in 2020 and no longer have the same, uh, we no longer have the amount of green space and park acres needed to su support public health needs. As a port commissioner, you'll have a significant, you have oversight over a significant amount of property and green space. How will you pri prioritize environmental and anti-displacement projects for the port to ensure good health? That's a great question. Um, well, I will first say that I will bring proactive leadership to that and not reactive leadership. Um, you know, starting with the North SeaTac Park, I was one of the first people who set the proposal of North SeaTac Park being converted into a parking lot um, was a terrible idea. And, um, should have not even been considered. And as port commissioner, I think what I would do immediately is ensure that we have a list of priorities and things that, you know, our staff and um, the port should, you know, not do. And putting parks in our um, green spaces is, is something that I would ensure that that does not happen. We need to be proactive and not reactive when it comes to protecting our forests and our parks. Um, and, you know, even now North SeaTac Park wasn't being considered for a parking lot, but it was then considered for a warehouse again. I live in South King County and understand um, how important that park is to our neighborhood and how much it pr protects us from things like ultrafine particle pollution. And so um, those are top priorities for me, ensuring that we um, are being proactive when it comes to protecting our community. Um, the King County Public Health uh, released a, a report that showed um, near airport communities um, who are majority people of color have higher um, incidence of hospitalization for heart disease um, than the rest of the of than, than the rest of King County. Um, airport airport communities have higher rates of hospitalization for stroke than the rest of King County. Um, airport communities ha have higher rates of death than the rest of King County. And that is in the heart of the airport operations. And so while we have to, um, we have to be able to balance the port's operations around the public health impacts that are happening, that has to go hand in hand. And, you know, we have built our economy on fossil fuels and there's not a switch that we can turn off, but there is a lens that we can apply. There is a public health lens that we can bring to the port of Seattle that is needed to protect the communities that we have benefited from, right? Um, that we have built around. And um, that's the, the sort of lens I'll be able to bring is to balance the business that the port is involved in, as well as ensuring that um, our parks and communities are also um, top priorities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Paulina, uh, we are, I think so for now, we're going to um, do our closing uh, question and that will be, um, we'll have just um, a short amount of time, about one minute for each uh, answer for each candidate. Um, and then um, we will uh, close out. So each candidate will have an opportunity to ask, answer the same question. Paulina, do you want to ask that question? Yes, of course. Um... So uh, as the, we know, um, how would you prioritize the health and well-being uh, of people who have been historically disproportionately impacted by pollution? And you talk some a little bit about this, but um, exclusively right now, as the part of Seattle is in the process of passing a resolution to reach zero emissions, um, how can you commit to an accelerating port strategy that knowing you know, the health disparities that we have and the brown, black communities like South Park, Georgetown, Allentown, SeaTac, Burien facing today, and how would you accelerate that decarbonization goal to create um, accessible spaces for participation and planning? And that will be how, how we're giving for all of you, how many seconds? So 90 seconds to respond, thank you. Let's start with, uh, Brian. I was going to say, do you want us to all go at once? Um, I, I, so I think here's the thing. It's really expensive, uh, but that's the bad news. The good news is uh, the Port of Seattle um, 
we are in a very good fiduciary position right now, and we are looking at a period of reco recovery in both aviation and maritime. And uh, thanks to strong federal supports through the, the COVID crisis, um, we're coming out of this um, pretty unscathed. So we've got the capacity to invest. It's gonna be expensive up front, but the payback I think is will be fairly short and will be meaningful both uh, for our communities and for our ability to, to say to our partners around the world, uh, we're a first mover in this area, whether it's sustainable aviation fuels at the airport or uh, renewable energy on the waterfront. Uh, we're leading efforts on this. And I actually think that's going to be a selling point for us as a port as we work with shipping and logistics companies, with uh, commercial aviation partners uh, and, uh, and others. And I think the really exciting thing is um, we live in a place where our constituency, the voters who elected us, are saying, go and do this. Uh, you have our your our mandate to go do this. So, you know, as I think, uh, as, as folks are thinking about who they're going to pick in these elections, I really hope that you are willing to pick transformative candidates, people who are willing to say, we're going to charge ahead with this, and we are um, voting for the future. Thank you. Let's move with um, Hamdi. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. And I just wanna say thank you for the opportunity to be able to share with all of you today. Um, you know, I bring a sense of urgency to a lot of the issues that the port um, is responsible for, whether that is labor and workers' rights, if that's economic development supporting our small businesses who've been hit really hard by this pandemic, environmental justice and climate change, we have to be able to as we transition um, that we're thinking about creating more green work and how do we protect impacted communities. Um, I, you know, the port has done a lot of really great things, even when we're looking at the, the lower uh, um, Duwamish uh, waterway groups, um, they've invested over $200 million into addressing some of the, the pressing issues that are happening, but there's more that needs to happen. And what I will be as an elected leader is being a bridge between the port and the community having a presence in the community. I'll be a port commissioner that has her boots on the ground doing the work alongside with community members. Communities members know, have the solutions, they know what their, their needs are and often are not invited to the table to engage. And I will be that authentic leader that will partner with you all and um, to come up with the solutions to protect our the health of our community, um, to continue to grow our economy, ensuring that our businesses who are interested in, in getting co port contracts have opportunities to do that. And so I look forward to working alongside all of you. Thank you so much for the time tonight. Thank you, Hamdi. Peter? Uh, sure. Um, when I first ran for uh, the Port Commission uh, three and a half, four years ago, uh, I pulled out a heat map of impacted communities uh, based on the health studies of health dis disproportionalities of King County that has been done. And I dem that, that heat map demonstrates a concentration of disproportionately impacted communities when it comes to public health and many other indicators of, of, of negative outcomes. And that just establishes you know, a foundational approach for us to center equity in everything we do and use um, the best information and data that we can apply, that we can obtain and apply so that we can direct what resources we have available with the port. We can't solve all these problems, but we do a whole lot for an organization that has a limited mission, unlike general governments. I think we're doing more than any other agency or government in South King County when it comes to addressing economic uh, and, uh, and social impacts uh, and health impacts there. So centering equity, it starts with that. I established a plan to study and inventory all the trees under the port's ownership and all of its lands. The first ever tree inventory undertaken by the Port of Seattle, that has been done. And we are now moving to develop a land stewardship policy to combine that effort of tree preservation, tree planting protection, and we, we are working that through through various resources, such as the community fund that I also established to, to address 
the heat islands in particular that have uh, a dearth of trees, of urban trees and too much pavement. And so these programs are at work. We're making progress. It's, it's going to take time. I think we should plant at least 100,000 more trees in the next five years through these resources and programs that we have already started. The other one is the equity you, index that our Office of Equity developed that is also working to help direct resources where they're most needed and the most disp disproportionately impacted communities. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie. Thank you. Um, I'll be really brief because I know that we're over time here. Um, I'll just take a step back and I think the question was really about how do you prioritize the health and well-being of those most impacted? And for me, it's about your vision. What is your vision for the Port of Seattle? Well, let me tell you what my vision is. My vision is that the Port of Seattle has the lowest carbon footprint of any port in the United States at a minimum. That's at the airport, at our seaport, at our cruise operations, economic development, our marinas, we have the opportunity to be a port that can lead in this country um, and in the world, quite frankly. And what's great about that, when you really focus the lens of that's the way to prioritize the health and well being of our residents, is thinking about it through that lens carbon sequestration, carbon reduction energy efficiency. And at the same time, having that as your mission and as your vision for the Port of Seattle can create thousands of jobs. Um, we've got a wonderful opportunity here to build really the Port of the Future built on the basis of climate change and what we're going to do about it. So that's how I would prioritize it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Stephanie. Toshiko, please. I know that you have another commitment going. So I will apologies. keep it very brief for the good of the order. And you know, um, there's a couple tangible actions that I would take. One of them is, you know, we all support the NCAP and the goal to um, reach zero um, emissions by, you know, prior to 2035. But I think that we can also set short-term benchmarks to try and reach those. Um, you know, push the, the envelope on some of those goals. I support the establishment of a community advisory board and not delaying that. Um, but also you have to elect people with the right values who have lived experience, who are actually impacted um, by these decisions and not leave it to somebody else to make decisions on our behalf. Look, before I announced, I talked to community members. I talked to groups um, representing historically marginalized community members. I talked to labor and they advised that I would run for this position because the Commissioner Steinbrook does not have the right values. He's taking money from Alaska. He's taking money from Delta. He's taking money from big money and corporations when business as usual is literally killing our community members. Good enough, having done good enough up to this point is no longer good enough. Um, and so I'm running to make sure that we are prioritizing the health of people and our planet over profits, period. Thank, thank you so much. Um, uh, for responding the last, and I know that we are moving into a media mm -hmm. um, uh, right now. Rebecca, are we ready to do that? I just wanna say thank you all very much uh, for your participation. Thank you to the many participants that um, have joined us tonight. Um, and for those who are on Facebook and um, YouTube, uh, we appreciate your participation. Um, don't forget to vote. We have an election coming next week and um, we uh, for the, the, so the time for the public questions and uh, forum is over and um, the commissioners, if you want to stay on uh, for media questions, um, we'll give about five minutes uh, for folks to uh, filter off um, and then uh, we'll begin the media. And uh, I believe there's a slide for the media. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm.